Good evening, this is Brass Tax. I'm Zaka Jacob. India is all set to host the G20 summit next year. It is a matter of pride for India because it is a recognition of India's growing place in the global order. But Congress leader Jairam Ramesh has tweeted that G20 presidency is by rotation and there is no need to make an event out of it. He's also gone on to attack Mr. Modi for being more of an event manager and less of a statesman. But the question is if the G20 can be used as an instrument to promote tourism across India, much like the Olympics can be or the Asian Games or the Commonwealth Games, why not use this as an opportunity to shore up brand India rather than pick holes where none exist? India has begun its year-long presidency of G20, taking over from Indonesia. The timing of India taking the reins of the G20 could not be more crucial. There's a geopolitical shift following Russia's war on Ukraine and uncertainty over economic recovery post the pandemic. Yet when India has been given this unique opportunity to take the lead in tackling global challenges, some in the opposition continue to mock the Modi government's efforts. Senior Congress leader Jairam Ramesh said India's G20 presidency was inevitable because countries rotate, but no other nation that held the responsibility earlier staged a high-voltage drama as is being done now, even calling Prime Minister Modi an event manager. It's a bizarre statement because uh, there is a lot of content, there is a lot of homework done. It's about discussing on shaping the future of the world. India will host as many as 200 meetings across the country over the next one year. The G20 summit will be organized in New Delhi in September 2023. Prime Minister Modi vowed that India's presidency of the G20 will be inclusive, ambitious, decisive and action-oriented. We think uh, India has made tremendous amount of progress under the Prime Ministership of Narendra Modi ji. And it is not just us. The rest of the world acknowledges that India is a country that is seen with awe and respect by the countries and peoples around the world. So by attacking India's G20 presidency, is the Congress putting petty politics above national interest? All right, and now Prime Minister Modi himself has countered the criticism from the Congress party and from Jairam Ramesh at a rally in Gujarat. The Prime Minister called India's G20 presidency a big opportunity for the development of the country and for the state of Gujarat. But he says the Congress falls ill at the very idea of development. Let's play out that soundbite and then we'll bring in our guests. Bharat G20 na desho na samono netrutva sambali rahu chhe. A G20 desho itle दुनिया ने पंचोतेर टका अर्थव्यवस्था नु संचालन जे लोगों करे जे एवा देश हो चे एना मुखिया तरीके हवे भारत ने तक मरी चे अने गुजरात माटे पर एक मोटो मोको चे भाइयों ये बात साची चे काब दुजे थेरी हो चे ने विकास all right, joining us on the talking points, Sanju Varma, BJP national spokesperson, Dr. Anshul Avijit, Congress spokesperson, Vishnu Prakash, former diplomat and MEA spokesperson, Aarti Tukhu is founder and editor-in-chief of The New Indian, and Dheeraj Sharma, author and director with IIM Rotak. Uh, let me start with uh, Sanju Varma. Uh, this is what Jairam Ramesh tweeted. He says that this is more about event management. Uh, the G20 presidency happens by rotation, and he lists out the 10 or 12 countries that have hosted G20 before. So why all this event management is the question from the Congress party. You know, Zaka, uh, I am not uh, particularly surprised by Jairam Ramesh's reckless uh, remark. Uh, it is so typical of the Congress mindset uh, to dismiss anything. Uh, you know, as I keep saying, uh, and I will repeat it at the cost of uh, sounding, uh, you know, uh, uh, repetitive. A Modi virod me, desh virod bhi. Uh, I will tell you a couple of things why this G20 presidency is so uh, important. It is unique in more ways than one because A, it comes against the backdrop of two very big black swan events. 
First, the COVID pandemic in 2019-20, in more than 100 years, which completely unsettled supply chains across the globe. We were barely recovering from that, that you had earlier this year, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So I think against that backdrop, for India to take over the G20 presidency, we'll have more than 200 events going forward across almost all major cities uh, in India over the next uh, one year. The reason it is also important is because I think okay. geopolitically the world is getting more polarized. And I think the Prime Minister has shown that, you know, he can be, you know, uh, for want of a better phrase, he can be an alpha male when he chooses to be one. Because don't forget that uh, earlier this year in September, uh, on the sidelines of the SEO uh, meet at uh, Samarkand, uh, he categorically told Putin that India believes in dialogue and not in abetting any form of conflict or warfare. He was obviously referring to the uh, conflict of uh, Russia and Ukraine. Okay. And then again, at the G20 meet in Indonesia, he reinforced that. But mind you, despite telling Russia that dialogue is what we believe in, he did not bow down to Western pressure. We continue to buy oil from Russia when it was commercially beneficial for us. Despite All right. The US so let me uh, let me then take take this to Dr. Anshul Avijit. There's going to be 200 meetings for the G20 over the next seven months across 50 cities. It'll start from the 1st of December, go on all the way till 30th of November next year. Now this is going to happen in some of the least explored and most exotic parts of India. If this is going to help give a huge fillip to brand India and tourism in India, then what's wrong with that, Dr. Anshul Avijit? No, I think, uh, Zaka, you're completely missing the point. The point is that uh, the BJP spares no occasion, no event, no bipartisan government event to promote the Prime Minister or the BJP itself. Firstly, I mean, unquestionably, the logo of the G20 is the BJP logo. I mean, without any doubt about it. I mean, the national flower is pink. It's not saffron. Secondly, the Prime Minister opens... The, the national flower is the himself. lotus. I mean, I yeah, don't think I, I don't think it's uh, yeah, it's, it's immaterial right? what it's color it is, isn't it? I mean, the lotus is the national flower. It's not just a party flower. But anyway, go no, on. Make your that, point. Go on. No, yeah. no, hang on. I mean, this is unquestionably the BJP logo. You set the grounds for politicization. Everything is drenched in politics before it is served by the BJP. Okay, go that on. And I'll tell you how. Allow me to finish, Zaka. Hmm. The Prime Minister himself opened the doors to critique when in Bali he turned all his speech into an election speech. I mean, uh, while critiquing, you know, the, deriding the opposition in that bucking kind of way, all the bombast that he said, um, he opened the doors for it. So every occasion, if it, that is an election speech, we have no problem. You know, you critique no, uh, the do opposition. No, Dr. Avijit, please answer the question I asked you. What is wrong if there are 100 meetings in 50 different cities across the country, if this is going to help give a fillip to brand India and tourism in India, particularly after, you know, the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war and the economic slowdown, why not celebrate the G20? What's wrong with that? Why not make, why not make an event out of it? Yes. You know, we are celebrating the G20. Politics, diplomacy, international diplomacy, you know, the fact that we are leaders of the world, we are not new to the, uh, this. I mean, the, the, the standards were set much before this government in, came into power, as much as the prime minister would like to deny it, as he did in Bali when he said, when he completely uh, blanked out history before 2014, he said it. So, you know, if you turn everything into something deeply political, okay. we are critiquing the politics of turning this into political. Okay, let me there ask uh, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, as, as a former diplomat, uh, I know, you know, countries and cities that win the bid to host, let's say, the Olympics or the Asian Games or the Commonwealth Games, that's, that's a huge deal. I mean, uh, we've seen from, you know, Beijing to uh, London, Tokyo recently, all, you know, converting that into a great opportunity for the city and for that country. Right? Why not make the same of G20? Or what Mr. Ramesh's point is, unlike, let's say, sporting events, G20 would happen by cycle. Every member will get to host it at some, at some point or the other. So India hosting the G20 was only inevitable. It was only a matter of time. Zaka, good evening. Uh, the government has never said that it is not rotational. Uh, the government has never said that previous governments have not done it, but they are doing that. Of course, it is rotational. Of course, this is India's uh, coming out party. Of course, it is the biggest national event or the biggest uh, international grouping that India is going to cheer since independence. 
the world's eyes will be on India for one year. And what is being planned is to showcase the best of India. What is wrong with that? Okay. Uh, you know, this is a major national event and the event has to be managed. So at a philosophical level, yes, you need an exceptional event manager to, uh, to handle such an event and meticulous preparations are being made. One big difference, Zaka, is that G20 and summits like this used to be elitist. In India, they are, it has been made into a people's festival, a national festival, mm. by popular involvement. Now, uh, the world is full of detractors. Uh, now, we need to need to show our show what we are capable of, our cultural heritage, our our uh, strides, economic strides that we have taken, and make the best of opportunity. Other okay. countries may not have. Other countries may not have uh, showcased it the way we have. Why should we not do that? Uh, I Ar fail to understand okay. what are we taking exception to. Uh, Arthi Tiku, how does the hosting of the G20 help change or, or reposition India's place in the world? Because the problems that we are facing externally or internally for that matter, externally, you know, the situation with China will continue the way it is. Uh, there isn't much love lost uh, with Pakistan. Uh, yes, the Quad is uh, improving and increasing engagement in the Indo-Pacific. But even with the United States, there are differences. Uh, the, the issue is, how does the hosting of a G20 change the profile of a country or, or you know, uh, better its external environment and its, and its external uh, troubles, as it were? Zaka, well, whether we like it or not, whether the opposition accepts it or not, but the fact is that G20 presidency coming to India at a juncture when India is in a very enviable position in the entire world. First of all, you know, the kind of vaccination program we did after the coronavirus pandemic, that itself established India's capacity to deal with crisis. I think that is mind boggling. That is something that the world has recognized, the WHO has recognized, the West has recognized, which was struggling during the pandemic. Then number two point is Europe is going through a crisis because of the war in Ukraine. And yeah. again, India enjoys a fantastic position diplomatically, strategically, because the West as well as Russia, we are seeing China, everybody is, is seeking partnership with India. So that, you know, you, that credit obviously will go to Prime Minister Modi's deft diplomacy, his strategic moves that he made in the last few years. You cannot take away all those, you know, uh, accomplishments from the man, from the leader of the country. You may, you know, do all kinds of politics, but, the, but at the end of the day, it is uh, Article 370's nullification when the West, if you remember, the liberal democracies yeah. in the West were at uh, India's throat. They were bashing against India in the last eight years. Washington Post, New York Times, they've been calling India a fascistic country and Hindutva fascistic country. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the 20 largest economies, the 20 most powerful countries of the world will be coming to India and this is a great opportunity okay. for us to showcase the development that I, has happened not only in 75 years but in uh, during Prime Minister Modi's uh, under okay. Prime Minister let, Modi's let me leadership. Ask, uh, Dheeraj Sharma, you know one of the problems and we saw this in the recently concluded G20 in Bali, uh, the joint statement almost did not happen uh, which would of course embarrass the host, it would have embarrassed the other countries there and that was primarily because of the Russia-Ukraine war. You saw the tensions when the Russian foreign minister was there, he left uh, right after the first day. Uh, and if this war does not get over in the next nine months before India hosts uh, the next G20, doesn't India risk uh, being sucked into this conflict where it's essentially NATO on the one side and Russia on the other? And India has good relations with both. But unfortunately, we'll have no choice but to get sucked into this whole thing like Indonesia was. And, and, and the joint statement, like I said, almost did not happen till the very last minute. Uh, thank you, Zaka. I think the winter is around the corner and negotiations and reconciliations also come around the winter time in Europe. So you would see, uh, you know, that all these things will come to a particular standstill. See, the, the situation in Indonesia is different. Russia is a very powerful country, very big country. It needs space saving. And 
the opportunity of face saving was not really offered at that point in time. Uh, yeah. It was largely a joint statement, which was sort of uh, coming in a in a not so not so very not so very vociferous or not so very balanced manner. But as we stand today, India has got a chance. Next several months, India will play a very very important role. Next century belongs to Indian wisdom. I must tell you. And uh, uh, you know there was there was a lot of discussion that I could hear on on this being uh, taken away as a as a credit to the current prime minister. Now, is the current prime minister lucky? Yes, he is very lucky. Uh, he's, these opportunities are coming at a time when he's the prime minister of the country. But at the same time, we witnessed some of the biggest crises hitting the world during the regime of the current prime minister. These are all opportunities, and I think uh, situational leadership, as we call it in management domain will play a very, very important role. When positions are thirst upon you, yeah. not necessarily uh, have come your way directly or indirectly as a result of your direct or indirect effort, but positions are there. Uh, Prime Minister uh, and the current government will have a significant role. One, because you would realize that 75% of the global resources are consumed by G20 nations. Mm -hmm. 57 to 67% of the world GDP comes from these 80% of the gross world product comes from these nations. So India being the president of G20 is a is a very, very important task as in date. Okay. We've done some analysis here of all the G20 nations. Mm -hmm. Barring three nations, there is nobody showing positive growth. And India is amongst those three. So from economic standpoint, from diplomacy standpoint, I think this is going to be a significant, significantly Okay. Very, very important uh, Let, role for India. And India I, will stand to benefit. I, I, I'll take one of the points that uh, Professor Sharma made, and I think it's valid. Uh, leadership is not just, you know, about, uh, uh, there, there is also situational leadership. If events are thrust on you that are beyond your control, the way you respond to it uh, is a very, very important factor. And I think the pandemic is a, is a great example of that. But I want to go back to Sanju Varma. Sanju Varma, you know, the, the question that's being asked again is this. You know, the big event that could likely shape, you know, the next seven, eight months, and we're already seeing sort of visible traces of this in the Western world, is what many are calling the coming recession. We're seeing that happen with the tech companies in the US. We're seeing that in the, U in the UK and other countries in Europe. My point is, if the Western world is going to go through a recession, of course, India is far away from a recession, but the knock-on effect will affect India as well. Will that become the dominant theme of India's G20 and India's G20 year? You know, Zaka, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, and, you know, it's completely up my alley. Uh, so I'll just say this to you. Uh, just, uh, you know, um, uh, a day back, uh, we had the uh, quarter to FY23 GDP numbers coming in and India grew at 6.3%. And people said, oh, this is a come down from the 13.5% that we uh, had in the first quarter of the current financial year. My simple point is this first half India's GDP stands at 9.9%. Assuming a worst case scenario of 4% in the second half, which is what the RBI has projected, India will still end up with a 6.95% GDP growth for the full year of the current financial year. And if, you know, God willing, we do 4.5% in the second half, India will actually end up with a GDP growth of 7.2%. In financial year 2022-23, which I think is excellent, given that for two quarters in a row, you saw the US uh, seeing negative GDP growth, you had UK seeing a negative GDP growth of 0.6% last quarter, Germany is in the throes of recession. The limited point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, India in a sense is decoupled and, uh, you know, while uh, this talk of globalization is something I've always endorsed. I think our huge middle class market, which is yet to be completely tapped, is what is our strength. And okay. at the current rate, at which, say, I'll just give you a small example for naysayers. If you look at the numbers of Maruti Suzuki, Maruti Suzuki sells about 1.6 to 1.7 lakh units a month, which means that it is selling almost four to five cars every single minute. Now, that does not happen in an economy. Uh, which is likely to head into a recession. Sure. So while the opposition can browbeat about an impending recession in India, India is going to be one of the few countries which will buck right. the trend and will continue to grow at 7%. Conservatively speaking, if we actually manage to up the ante a little bit, if government spending picks up 
uh, private capex cycle uh, moves up further you could actually see 8% in All the right. next 18 months or so. So, Dr. Anshul Avijit, uh, I keep coming back to this. The fact that India is hosting the G20 and, you know, we had uh, Professor Sharma and others talk about this, almost 70% of the world's GDP, 60 to 70% of the world's GDP is controlled by these 20 countries and India is hosting uh, the G20 summit. Why not celebrate that? Why not, you know, use that as an opportunity to re-kickstart uh, you know, uh, life as we know it has changed over the last three years because of the pandemic and the war and so on. But to get back to a semblance of normalcy, why not use uh, the G20? No, no, we are delighted. We are not delighted at the politicization of the G20 that this government is relentless about and the prime minister in particular, a kind of self-promotion that we've seen all the time at every occasion, at every bipartisan occasion. And now since we are talking about statistics, you know, let me throw a few. Did you know that among all G20 countries, our per capita GDP is actually the lowest? We're talking about the pandemic. The First of all, the Prime Minister never ordered the vaccines, which led to the deaths of countless lives. I don't know what we're bragging on about, right? Uh, you never were prepared for the second wave. You all know what happened during those pandemic we years. And how much hardship... Madam, let me allow me to speak. I heard you very patiently. Let me we bust some of those numbers. Uh, let me just... Uh, yep, yeah, you stop. Okay, uh, Sanju, 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 Sanju Varma, please allow him, allow him to make his point, please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, do you know what the inflation has been desperately trying to control inflation, which is above the RBI target of 4%. No, look, look, madam, if I heard you very patient. Sanjuji, let, let him make his point. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Let, let him make his point. I'll come back to you. Anshul Avijit on screen, please. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, yeah, sure, sure, madam. Let me just get my numbers. Uh, please listen to me. You're in. What about your inflation numbers? Can you deny that the target of the RBI is 4% and inflation has been consistently high on month on month? What about that number? You are just floating high frequency data. Your per capita GDP is the lowest among all GDP, uh, all G20 countries. Among all G20 countries, by the way, you uh, your fiscal stimulus during the pandemic was the lowest. It was about 2%. Right. So this is comparison to the G20. You know, the prime minister keeps saying and he, he made this speech in Bali that, you know, I made about three crore houses. And that is the population of Australia. Does he know that the G GDP per capita of Australia is sixty thousand dollars? It's about I, God knows how many times more than India. So these comparisons, of course. No, no, no. Know, one second. You know, despite all of that, no, Anshul Avijit, no, despite, numbers, despite all, all of that, Dr. Anshul Avijit, despite all of that, weak, if India, it, one second, one second, if India today finds itself in a position where, you know, the prime minister is sitting next to Vladimir Putin and telling him this is not the era of war. Surely that's got to count for something. How, you tell me, no, tell me have, how many other world leaders can and have said that in the last uh, nine months since his war began. Look, Zaka, international diplomacy is aside. We, uh, we have a diplomatic position on Ukraine, on Russia. Um, we expect that to unfold. But, you know, the, I come back to the point again and again. It begins with the logo. I don't know why you're trying to deny that. It begins with the logo. It begins with the speeches that are said ceaselessly all the time, which is politicization, which is promotion. Of course, we're delighted. This is not due to us hosting, you know, international su sum summits okay. with, with plomb. Uh, we have we've done it since since 1983. All right. Sanjay Verma, the respond, and then I'll go to the other three guests, and I'll close out the debate after that. Sanjay Verma, respond, please. Yeah. You know, Zaka. What I find extremely amusing is the fact that the moment we start talking of GDP, uh, the uh, Congress... Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go on. We can hear you. Go yeah. on. I'm not in fear, madam. And I'm not okay, you because, okay, okay, Zaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you, you can say please. without any... Okay, hold your horses. Zaka, can I please make yeah, my Yeah, 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 I'm listening. Yes, Thank go you. ahead. Yeah. Yes. The amusing bit is that the moment we start talking about GDP, the Congress comes in with the per capita income. The per capita income of Iceland is higher than India. The per capita income of Iran is higher than India. No, the per capita income of Brunei is higher than India. India. I'm please keep quiet. Zaka, this is not done. Anshul, Anshul, yeah, Anshul, 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 extend her the same courtesy, please. Done. Anshul, please. And let let her make a point. Yeah, okay. Right. Oh, only Sanju Varma, please. My yeah. apologies, madam. Fact, I refuse to speak. No, no, I go. Want to be a, yes. The per capita income of Iceland, the per capita income of Iran, the per capita income of Brunei, the per capita income of perhaps Vietnam is higher than India. So how does it matter? The hard truth is this. Today the world is in the throes of an incoming recession. India grew at 
percent last year. India okay. will likely grow at seven percent this year. And Zaka, when it comes to inflation, be it the US, the UK, the eurozone, every country is seeing inflation at nine percent, ten percent, what have you. If you look at the cumulative inflation of the last eight years under the Modi government, it is four point nine five percent. And in the US, I remember at the peak of COVID, where it was having shortage of uh, you know baby food. You know there are riots in France because of lack of fuel. Uh, you okay. know, uh, gas stations in UK were running dry. We ran the world's largest uh, vaccination drive. We ran the world's largest food security program. We have the world's largest financial inclusion program called the Janthan Yojana. We have the world's largest healthcare program. Okay. All right. Bharat. You've made all of those points. Let me now close out with the with the experts on the panel. Uh, uh, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, uh, you, you know, I think one of the panelists made a very good point that increasingly geopolitics is getting polarized. It's reflecting, you know, domestic politics across countries, whether it's in the U.S. here in India or wherever else. Uh, you have now the U.S. and the NATO camp, and then you have the Russia and China camp. Does India risk falling between camps, or will it get to a situation where India will have no choice because the geopolitics is so polarized between these two camps? We're basically going back to what looks like uh, some kind of a Cold War geopolitics. Well, that is not of our choosing, and that's a reality that we are we are facing. Uh, we have taken that on board. Uh, what India is planning to do is to try and be a consensus builder, try to be a peacemaker, try to uh, bring together parties and narrow differences, and to refocus the world attention on pressing issues like food security, energy security. Uh, sustainable growth, health crisis, digital transformation, and so on and so forth. Now, whether we will succeed, uh, I do not know. But what I know is that it would not be for want of trying. Okay. Uh, the meticulous preparations are being made. Every effort is being put in. And frankly, today, yes, India's per capita income is the lowest among G20 countries. Yes, we have lots of challenges, but we also have a lot of success stories. So India, what India is doing is an open book, and we have the ability to uh, stand for issues, uh, have the courage of conviction to chart out an independent course, and that is something the world respects. Okay, uh, so we, Arti, will, we will do our very, we will do uh, our very best. Uh, that is what I'm uh, sure. Uh, Arti Tiku, you know, one of the criticisms against the G20 and many such multilateral fora. Uh, is a it descends into a bit of a talk shop. You talk about lofty things like climate change and sustainable development, when actually the most pressing thing right now is the war, and no country in the world seems to be in a position to put an end to that war. So again, does it come back to how can G20 India India's presidency be more than just a talk shop? Well, uh, as I said earlier, Dhaka, that India is in a very, very interesting position across the world today, especially as a key player who can build consens consensus, who can also be a peacemaker. If you remember, Prime Minister Modi tried to bridge uh, the gap between Russia and the West on the Ukraine war. And I think the uh, slogan which really captures the sentiment, uh, as uh, the ambassador was also saying, a Prime Minister's slogan which said one earth, one family and one future. I think the whole philosophy of India and uh, Prime Minister Modi's philosophy as well that it has to be, the, the world has to coexist and all heads have to come together and they have to, ha it is time for peace and not for war. And I think okay. that will be the underpinning of India's presidency right. of the G20. I'll and give, I'm I'll give sure Professor Sharma it is not the final word. I'm really out of time. Talk. Professor Sharma, 30 seconds. Uh, exactly. on, uh, how will India's presidency of G20 be defined as a success? or not so much of a success, what will be the, the yardstick as far as you are concerned? I think two very important things. One, I think the, the India will play a, a very important mediator. Today, there's a statement from President Biden welcoming India's presidency and also supporting yeah. India's presidency. And also Correct. there is a kind of simultaneous statement from the foreign minister of Russia, which demonstrates that India will play a very, very important role. And there is a tribute to Indian diplomacy over the years, which has been able to build such strength in, in, in solving this, right. this very, very important problem which is going on. Second, what you've mentioned, I think we're neglecting that part. 
tourism continues to be the backbone of several countries, including India. You know, we used to be in 2019 about 30, 31 billion dollars of tourism. Uh, today, those numbers, because of the COVID situations, are down. I think G20 will provide an impetus to our economy. Will give a shot in the arm to to various tourist right. sectors within India and also recognize us as the destination. I think okay. destination branding for India will be very, very important. We, we'll, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, I agree with the final point that Professor Sharma made, and I think it's an absolutely valid one. Uh, I think Brand India, the incredible India campaign from back from the 90s and early 2000s, it, it did uh, a huge amount for changing the perception of India, uh, India being not just an investment-friendly destination, but also a tourism-friendly destination. So both of these things will be top of the map again uh, when India gets to host the G20 next year. So thank you very much to all our guests uh, joining us uh, on this talking point. I'm going to take a quick break here on the program. When we come back, we'll shift focus to domestic politics and just ahead of the MCD polls, which are due later this weekend. Uh, there is a big controversy around the 1984 anti-Sikh riots accused Jagdish Tatler, who is campaigning today for the Congress. The Congress says it's been 35 years. No court of law has found him guilty. How long will this Damocles sword hang over his head? That debate right on the other side of the spread.